that everything that goes on in America is connected to Ukraine, it's connected to Russia, it's connected to Israel, it's connected. And so we're very, we taught young people to be very passionate about everything that's happening around the world while uh, too often we're ignoring what's going on, the chaos, dysfunction, problems we have here in America, and that's why I'm an America first person, and, and I'm just, I guess I'm an isolationist, because I, I don't, I sympathize with Ukraine, I sympathize with Palestinians, and I sympathize with Israel, uh, I, heck, I sympathize with Russia, but I'm really only concerned about America, your reaction. I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with focusing primarily or exclusively on home, especially um, if home is filled with problems. For example, if a black person in America said, look, I ain't got time to worry about the Palestinians right now. I ain't got time uh, to worry about Ukrainians. I got to worry about uh, violence in my community. I got to worry about inequality and justice, unemployment, all that stuff. I don't get mad at them. I don't say they're wrong. What I do say, though, is that we have to think about, one, the moral imperative. I think there is a moral imperative. Um, but I also think that there is a connection between what we do here in the United States uh, and what happens around the globe, especially uh, when you look at our role as a global superpower. So specifically, if you're looking at Palestine, just as a, I mean, that's a perfect example, what happens in Palestine only happens because we fund Israel three to four billion dollars a year. The war that's going on, the genocidal war that's taking place right now can only take place because we continue to send more money. I and mean, we're trying to send an aid package right now with the, with tens of billions of dollars in it, right? Not all of it for, for military aid, but at least nine billion of it is military aid. So we're responsible. We're the ones vetoing ceasefires. So yeah, as, a, as an American college student, I do think they have to think about where their tax dollars go. I think they have to think about the people they elect for office, Democrat and Republican, and they have to be able to have a, a sustained critique as a moral issue, but also as a political issue. So the connections are there. Connections are there. But, and again, Mark, I know you're on college campuses virtually every day. So you, you have a bit more of an insider's perspective than me. But from the outside, and I live here in Nashville, and there are five college campuses right here in the Nashville area, including Vanderbilt. Uh, and so I, I look and hear the kids on these. I don't think they know what they're even protesting about, the majority of them. And I believe there are outside agitators that are leading a lot of this chaos. And so I just find the whole protest thing inauthentic. And it's like, it's the thing to do. We're globalists and we're concerned about this or that. I just find it phony. Do you think these kids are informed and know what they're actually protesting about? I'll tell you this, this is probably the most informed generation of kids we've ever seen in college. Uh, and they certainly know more about these global issues than I ever did in, in when I was 20. And it's because of social media. It's because of the TikToks and Instagrams and stuff. Now, we, you and I may disagree on whether they're getting the right narrative, but they're at least in a conversation globally uh, that I wasn't in. That we, we didn't have the capacity to be in back there. Um, I think I've never been I've been I've been an activist and organizer since I was 15. I've never been to an action uh, where some people weren't there to get girls, where some people weren't there because they, they look cool, where some people weren't there because, you know, they were bored. That's always the case. So I don't I don't hold this generation to a higher or lower standard than another generation. But what I will say is when I spent time in the Columbia University encampment, uh, which is the first one really in this country, uh, I spent some time there and I talked to the kids. I looked at what they were doing. I listened to the questions they were asking. I looked at the work they were doing on the ground. I was incredibly, I mean, incredibly impressed with their knowledge, but also their commitment. And look, sometimes you just know something is wrong, but you don't have the details. A lot of us boycotted apartheid in South Africa. We didn't really understand the apartheid regime, but we did know that apartheid was wrong and that systems of racial injustice were wrong. And we fought and we learned as we went. And I'm okay with that. And so take your generation, and again, you're in your mid-40s. So these people taking over buildings and, and doing some form of, I don't know, what, looting, violence, damage may be the right word, 
to these buildings. And I'm, I'm just searching for the right word. But they've done some <laughs> form of damage and people in New York, uh, Mayor Adams, others are frustrated and, and they're trying to put a stop to that. Is that the kind of protest you were involved with when you were in college? Don't you think these kids maybe, have you seen the videos of the UCLA protesters look like the Bloods and the Crips going at each other? You know, some were pro Hamas, some pro Israel. Uh, do, do, don't you think the kind of protest uh, we're seeing on college campuses looks more BLM-ish and, and dare I say, January 6th-ish than perhaps what you were doing when you were in college? One slight correction, some people were pro uh, or anti-war and some people might identify as pro-Israel, some might identify as pro-Palestinian. The group didn't identify as pro-Hamas. That, that, that's, that's an unfair characterization. But, but, but to, your, to, your, to your bigger question, I think we shouldn't get nostalgic about the past. You know, Martin, a sit-in, uh, taking over the Pettus Bridge, these are appropriations of public space. These are illegal activities. These, this is civil disobedience. Taking over a building is exactly what happened at Howard University 30 years ago, uh, taking over the A building. What, it's happened at Morehouse when I was there. It's happened at universities when, uh, as when I've been a professor. I don't have a problem with people taking over buildings. The, the problem now is, if anything, these corporate universities are trying to give students uh, protest areas. You know, I, I just saw a compromise made at Northwestern University where they told the students, okay, you can protest till June and we'll give you a protest circle. It ain't a protest if you give me the circle. It's not a protest if you give me a date to stop. I'm just doing what you want me to do. No, protest is supposed to disrupt the civic order. It's supposed to make the status quo unsustainable. I'm cool with that. Do I agree with violence? No. But a lot of the violence I saw at UCLA, to use your example, as you pointed, were outside agitators. It wasn't students. And a lot of it was based on misrepresentations of what was happening. I was um, very frustrated to see some prominent people misrepresent what's happening at UCLA and other places on their social media accounts. Uh, people like Emmanuel Acho, for example. So to me, at the end of the day, no problem, no problem at all with disruption. Again, you don't have to tear up the whole university, but, but, but making the university uncomfortable is exactly uh, what you're supposed to do. And I'm a parent of a college student, and I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm okay, I'm okay with it. Get your grades done, but tear some shit up too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, I hear that, Mark, tear some shit up too. And again, that's what I always hear from this protest movement that and connect BLM, Antifa, there are people very skilled at tearing down who I've seen no evidence of that they're capable of building anything. And so it just mm -hmm. seems like destruction for destruction's sake. And so if you could, oh, oh, well, let's start with the biggest scam we've had the last 10 years, BLM. What have they built? I, I know... I can rattle off everything they tore down. What have they built? You know, oh, when that's I think right. Of, they built new homes in gated white communities. Uh, but continue. Go ahead. What else have they built? You know, I, I wouldn't get into the specifics of, of individual members. We can have critiques of people's choices. But if you're talking about the actual movement and the movement for black lives, uh, I'll give you just one example. Mother's Day is Sunday after next. And there is a Mother's Day bailout. There's been a Mother's Day bailout for the last... I want to say six years, but certainly, certainly since the marches, where, we, where through mutual aid, we actually bail mothers out of jail so they can be with their families. We believe, I believe, and I think you believe, that families are a bedrock of our community. And oftentimes, people who are in jail because they don't have enough money not to be in jail, that, that's, that's a social issue. That's an economic issue that we need to repair. We've seen that. We've seen mutual well, hold, aid. Hold. That, no, I won't go. I want you to finish. Oh yeah, we've seen we've seen vote we've seen voter registration campaigns. We've seen uh, 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 food security or, or food responses to food insecurity. Community gardens built. We've seen breakfast programs. We've seen people right now trying to build schools. We've even seen people, and again, I don't agree with them, but they run in for office. So they've even made, mounted political campaigns. Some of them are self-serving, some of them are wrong-headed. But I'm saying things have come out of this movement beyond uh, the individual actions of some people. So let's start Mother's Day bailout and, and having had family members in prison, including some mothers uh, in, in prison, what about the crimes they committed? 
What about victim bailouts? Again, people aren't just, and I know people love to say it, but people aren't just, because they're in jail. No, so, I, I so you think to, that, that's... You no, know, you, you go to jail waiting trial. That's the problem, right? They're not, I did not, these aren't prison bailouts. Someone jail. thinks they committed a crime. I mean, and, and, look, again, take... Someone accused my mother's of, lived 85 years without going to jail. And, and you know, I don't... It, it's not as difficult as people think, to avoid jail. So, so We've Jason, made it seem like if I just step outside, I can go to jail. It's actually very difficult. And I used to do a lot of shady stuff. And I've only been to jail once, and that was for driving with a suspended license. But So it, it's, it's, and again, that's, I, that's I don't want to out my family members, but my family members that went to jail and friends that went to jail, they're pretty stupid, but continue. I, I love I, I, them, but they're pretty stupid. I don't want to conflate jail and prison here, but what I would say is if yeah. you're in jail awaiting trial, and, you, and you're waiting for your fair trial, according to the Constitution, you're innocent until proven guilty. I find that some people, especially on the right, love to, they love the Constitution and they love the, the, the due process when people go to jail, but when people are waiting trial, this, it's like they're guilty. Well, we don't know if they're guilty. By, by the legal standard, they're innocent. But even if I were to concede that every person in jail Every single one of them was guilty of the crime, even though they haven't gone to trial yet. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be allowed to be with your family. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be allowed bail. It shouldn't. It doesn't mean that you should be a. The, the problem here is a rich person can afford bail and a poor person cannot. And so the rich person who who who's out of jail is out of jail not because they're less guilty. They just have more money. That's not a fair a system. I don't want to be in a system where the reason I'm in jail or not in jail is based on my income. That is an evil system. And so the Mother's Day bailout is not an attempt to resolve or adjudicate innocence or guilt. It's a way of saying, look, let's say a mom did buy some heroin. And let's say she, she, she did get caught with possession. And let's say she's sitting there for 90 days. She's not better off in jail than being home with her kids. Because when those kids go to the, the system, when they go to foster care, when they get sent off, they're more likely to go to jail, more likely to be assaulted, more likely to be molested, more likely to kill themselves, more likely to get HIV AIDS. Nobody's life is better when mommy and daddy's in jail. Now, I'm not saying mommy and daddy don't have responsibility for that, but I'm saying as a community, we also have a duty to repair for, for our own sake, even if it's not because I care about mom and daddy. I just don't want them robbing you or me. And again, I don't want them robbing you or me. And so if they're a robber and they've been accused of robbery, and, and again, I don't think the bail system is so problematic, having bailed some people out, including some relatives or whatever, that, that I get that some individual is poor, but if you, bail's not so oppressive that you can't come up with petty crimes or crimes that aren't short of murder, rape, and some of these other things, you can get bail. And I, I just, this whole that, mentality that, that's that has- That's true, 80% of people in jail are there because they don't have enough money not to be. 80%, this isn't a small number, 80% are there because they don't have the money to afford the bail. This is not, this is not a case where most, most people just did the crime and the Somebody crime was so bad. Somebody could argue, could, couldn't they argue that uh, 95% of the people in jail are there because they did something wrong? Yeah, but there'd be no, so there's no Isn't evidence. is that more that likely? That no. There's no because, evidence that they did something wrong. The police are just randomly, because I, I don't understand how I haven't got swept up in this. If I'm, I've done nothing wrong, I'm not in jail, I can't believe I haven't been swept up and just put in jail because... Again, you know, that's what the police are doing? No, I'm responding specifically to your claim that is it more likely that 95% of people in jail are, are actually guilty? And I'm saying there's no evidentiary basis. There's no statistical basis. And as a, as a social scientist, I can't just randomly pluck numbers out. The 80% that I pointed to is statistically demonstrated. Now, it, that doesn't mean they, they didn't do it. Again, I'm not saying that the 80% who can't afford to get out are all innocent. I'm not making a case of innocence or guilt. I'm making a case that even if you did many of these crimes, and again, I didn't talk, I was talking specifically about the drug addict in the example I gave, and I'm saying a person who has a, an, a, an addiction is likely to do crimes of addiction. And putting them in jail doesn't actually stop that because when they get out, they, they're still on heroin, they're still on crack. They still have the same challenges, they still, and it's harder for them to get labor. It's harder for them to find community. I'm saying we have to create possibilities for people to make them safer. Now, to tie this full circle to the, to the campus protest thing, I, I don't think those two things are disconnected. I would say to somebody, 
who's looking at, at Palestine, for example, and say, look, yeah, if you're in the hood, you might not be able to worry about Gaza because you, you're worried about what's happening in South Central or you're worried about what's happening in North Philly. And I would say that's OK. But even the way that we do security, even the way that we talk about policing, even the way we talk about uh, incarceration is connected to Israel and Palestine because U.S. police are trained some of them, not all of them, some US police departments are training in Israel and some Israeli police departments and military are training in the United States. It's a mutual thing. I'm gonna be very clear about that. Israel is not teaching America how to kill black people. That would be an anti-Semitic blood libel. I'm saying that both nations share security tactics and policing tactics, which do impact how we are policed and how the vulnerable racialized populations, whether it's Palestinians or black people in the United States, are treated by law enforcement. So I'm saying we can draw connections here or there, or I could make it even more basic than that. I could say, and maybe you would agree with this more, Jason, I could say, you know, if we weren't sending $16 billion, you know, if we, if we weren't sending $16 billion in bonus military weapons to prosecute an illegal war in, in Gaza right now, Maybe we could use that money to invest in communities and in neighborhoods and in schools and in opportunities so that people could do well for themselves. Maybe if we spent the money differently, we wouldn't be here. So, I mean, I, I, could, I think there's lots of reasons to connect over there to over here. Well, for me, there are no political or financial solutions for spiritual problems. And we have a spiritual problem. We have a uh, corrupt culture throughout America, through, throughout America. I'm going to personalize it, though, to uh, African-Americans, black people, because you have, and a lot of these arguments are always framed as, hey, people of color are oppressed. And, and the understanding, again, if we just narrow the focus, because I don't know all the details of Palestine and Israel, but if we narrow the focus to America, there are certain cultural characteristics of uh, 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 criminality that is promoted through rap music and through whatever the culture is that actually leads people to making the kind of mistakes and choosing the kind of lifestyle that will put them in prison. Because what I've seen is a lot of black people, a lot of my friends that I grew up with, when those people that don't uh, participate or believe in that corrupt culture, they're not getting locked up. They're not getting arrested on petty crimes or big crimes or anything. They're out raising, taking care of their family, providing for their family and all that. So there are cultural things that I think are impacting America far more than skin color things. And I, it's, I think it's a very nice, simplistic argument to make on television or on, on social media that everything's related to race and uh, everything is oppressor versus oppressed dynamic, when a lot of this, much of, if not all of it, is just like, what culture have you chosen to uh, participate in, believe in, live by? I'm choosing to, and I used to not be this way, but I'm trying to embrace a Christian culture and it keeps me, but even when I was just like half-stepping, a little bit Christian and a little bit of the world, it just wasn't that hard for me to avoid jail. And, and all this sympathy hmm. we have for everybody that's in jail, and again, I've had people that I love in jail, love, but I know what they did to get there. And, and I hear all the stories about the people that I was just minding my business and I was on my way to church and I had just finished my college course online and the police scooped me up and accused me of X, Y, and Z and now I'm in prison. I just haven't met those people. I hear the stories, but I just haven't met them. So I, I think, ironically, I, I, well, first I agree with you that these things shouldn't be reduced to simple answers. They're complex questions and we can't give simple answers to complex questions. But I, I think that it's not either or, it's both and. I'll give you, a, I'm going to tell you a super quick story. I was at Cook County Jail on Christmas one day visiting. I was with Jesse Jackson. And there was a group of men uh, there locked up. Again, most were awaiting trial because they were in Cook County Jail. He said, how many of you are here for a nonviolent drug offense? Hands go up. How many of you are here uh, over the age of 22? Almost no hands up. These were men 18, 19, 20. How many of you finished high school? Almost no hands go up. Um, broken education system, lack of access to jobs. How many of you have children? 
Hands go up. How many of you have two kids? Hands go up. He stopped asking after that. I don't think he wanted to ask what number three was. We understand uh, predatory systems. We understand broken educational systems. We understand how capitalism functions. We understand white supremacy, all those things. Jesse Jackson said to them, he said, how many of y'all want to help me shut this prison down or this jail down? They said, yeah, hands go up. How you want to, who wants to shut this prison down? They started yelling, yeah, what do we do? He said, don't come back no more. Jesse, no one would accuse Jesse Jackson of not having a political analysis. No one would accuse Jesse Jackson of not thinking and talking about race. But even Jesse Jackson at that moment understood and communicated to those young people, as I do, that we have options too. That we can starve a system that does want to exploit young black men. We can stop a predatory capitalist system by not investing in things. I tell young people when I talk to high schools, if you can't afford to buy it twice, don't buy it once. If you're trying to figure out if you can afford that watch, if you can't afford to buy it twice, you probably shouldn't buy it once because you need to save money, right? There are no one is ever against responsible behavior. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, none of these people who had critiques of, of capitalism and racism and militarism and had global critiques, none of those people didn't tell black folk to be responsible, didn't tell them to have a spiritual center, if that's what you believe in, didn't tell them, to, even if you don't, even if you're secular, to be good to people and to treat people well. So for me, it's never been, and I think the left, and particularly the black left, gets misrepresented and mischaracterizes people who only want to blame the white man for everything. That's never been my narrative. You, if you want to see a conservative, Jason, talk to me after I get off the phone with one of my family members that asked me to bail him out of jail. I got two calls a day. In fact, you texted me earlier. I was on the phone with a family member who's asking me to buy him a $300 uh, snack, ba ba snack basket for jail where he's sitting until he gets sentenced in a month. I, at that moment, when somebody's trying to borrow money, I get Bill Cosby. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not that I don't get all of that. I just have the capacity to recognize our role and our responsibility on the one hand, but on the other hand, to also say, the system is unfair, it's unjust. White supremacy is real. Predatory markets are real. All of it is real. And we don't have to choose between those two things. And so you will acknowledge that when MSNBC or CNN calls they don't want to hear the Bill Cosby version of Mark Lamont Hill. They want to put you in a discussion about what white supremacy did to black people today. Y you, you do acknowledge, like, on television and in these public spaces, social media, whatever, uh, blaming white supremacy and white people for everything and ignoring personal responsibility is what mm -hmm. CNN, MSNBC, and much of the mainstream media... That's what they want to hear. That's what they cut checks for. I, I disagree with that analysis because it, it frames it as a little more cynical than I think it is. I, I think there's no shortage of people who believe that black people are irresponsible and lazy and dishonest and lascivious. We don't need a, a whole media intervention on that. The intervention comes on the thing that we don't know. Right. If you're if you're breaking down a basketball game last night, my Sixers beat the Knicks. But if we had lost to the Knicks, it would have been very easy to point out the fact that Tyrese Maxey missed three free throws at the end of the game. And we would have lost presumably by three points had we had had we um, had we had we not pulled it out at the end. That's the easy analysis. You don't need to be a sports expert to analyze that. It's what about the other three quarters? It's what about Embiid's turnovers, right? It's what about our failure to go to go over screens rather than under them, right? Like the point is, there's a deeper analysis that needs to that needs to matter too. It doesn't mean his free throws. What about important. an accurate? What about an accurate analysis? What, I, what, I think the accurate. The accurate all part, of the things you're talking about, white supremacy. Let's say I'll give you that. There's there's some white bigotry and bias or whatever, but that's been, the, bias and all unfairness is a part of the world. And you can call it a many different things. You can call, hey, it's un, the way fat people are treated is unfair. Absolutely. The way women are treated, unfair, blah, blah. There's a, I'm willing to deal with all of that because I'm a fat person. And that's a choice that I made to be fat. And so that's hey. on me. But there, there's, no, it ain't no maybe to it. Trust me. <laughs> and it, Ronald McDonald's didn't, didn't, I asked Ronald McDonald to be my best friend. He didn't ask me to be his best friend. Uh, but, but more important is all of this, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. 
and, and there's just a, there is a simple answer. It's the breakdown of family. Mama and daddy are supposed to be in the same home raising that kid. That's the solution. Period. End of story. There's, there's a bunch of stats that you should know about parents in the same home with their kids and the outcome differences between people. And it cuts across all racial economic lines or whatever. Mom and daddy working together, not, not two daddies, not two mamas, not grandmama, not auntie, not, not single mama. Mom and daddy working together to raise them kids in the home. The results speak for themselves. And, and that's a message. And again, if that's a course of action we all need to take black, white, whatever we all need to take. And, and we ignore that to talk about, well, if they had just had a, a playground for kids to shoot basketball on O Block, they'd actually put the nine millimeters down and the, and the gangster disciples and vice lords would be BFF if they could just play basketball until midnight. It's a joke. But, but, but we can't selectively invoke data and evidence, right? Because the evidence shows that when we do have playgrounds, when we do have after school programs, when we do have big brother, big sister programs, people are less likely to commit crimes. Violence actually does go down when we have those things. But that doesn't mean that we don't need healthy, strong families. Now, again, I don't see that as a spiritual issue. I see that as a spiritual issue, a cultural issue, a social issue, economic issue. It's all of those. It's a political issue. Hear me out. You'll understand what I mean. You, you, you'll hear what I mean. For example, in the 1980s, we, in, two, in 1964, for 1965, there were about 250,000 people incarcerated. By the height of, of the incarceration boom in the end of the 90s, beginning 2000s, there were 2.5 million people incarcerated. And, a, and, and when you see that huge spike, tenfold in fact, they mostly come from black and brown communities, mostly from poor communities. One of the things that ripped fathers out of communities was mass incarceration. That's based on Democrat and Republican, but a lot of Democrat, uh, uh, a drug reform policy is based on crime bills and three strikes laws and prison litigation reform acts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yes, a political choice changed a social reality within a community. Now, you, we can have conversations about the choice to sell or use drugs. We can talk about all of that. But those things are also bound up in social realities. We closed, we closed for example, um, mental health facilities. We put people on the street without mental health resources. You, you close uh, you know, the mental health facility, you put people on the street, you make it illegal to be on the street, and then you criminalize homelessness, and then you have crack that hits the streets in, 1980, in 1983-84, uh, and, and people have access to a, a, a cheap synthetic drug that they now are self-medicating with, and then you intensify the war on drugs, you're creating a recipe for incarceration and fatherlessness and broken families. And because, the, for example, there's a, there's a um, private interest that says, look, if jail, if prison is privatized, or if we can uh, monetize prison, make them farther away, keep building them, create more laws, make the phone calls $5 a minute, pull daddies and daughters and daddies and sons away from each other, all of those things only make it worse. So I don't disagree that we, that I agree we have a choice in this. There are things we can do, but our but our conditions are and our choices are shaped by the situation around us, by the by the um by, by the conditions around us. And I'm just saying we, we, we can't look at one slice of it. We have to look at at all of it because the data shows, but just the last piece of it is that economics do matter. You know, I have um I'm married with a two-year-old. I also have two grown daughters. Uh, and I raised them not being married and we weren't in the same household, but I was a very active and involved father. I'm also an upper middle class person. Upper middle class people co-parent just fine. Um, upper middle class people, their kids' outcomes aren't that different than, than, than poor people. The problem is if, if, if you're poor and you ain't got two nickels to rub together, as my, as my grandmama would say, and then you keep having children, of course, if you're in separate homes, it's hard. And it's not a good choice. I agree. But I don't want to castigate poor people or act as if those conditions aren't shaped by other things. So I'm just saying all the pieces connect, all, all the pieces connect. Mark, I know you don't have you an endless amount of time. No, well, there's some of it, but at the end of the day, I mean, you started with saying something that sounded like marriage isn't a spiritual thing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
God created marriage. There, there would be no marriage. And again, we've tried to remove God from marriage, but there would be no marriage without the Bible and his word. And so, I, you know, I just reject you all that. You got to have just to talk about that. We got we to argue about that a whole other time. Who, who you think created marriage? No, I'm, that, George that, Washington? That, that, <laughs> who, who, who you think created it? And I can say, who do you think created religion, right? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation. I'm just saying it's a longer one than we probably had time for. But I'm down for it. Got you. But, but trust me, man knew nothing about marriage. Or that's not his creation. God created that. And again, God gives us our rights. And again, th that's the other. And we'll have to come back and talk about that because Ooh, there's this mentality me. among your group that thinks our rights come from the government. And, and they don't. They come from God. And that's our fundamental disagreement. But anyway, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, Mark, as always, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, I, I really do. I got a lot of respect for you because you sincerely believe the things you uh, say. And I just I respect the heck out of that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you again.